Hello. Um, my name is Noor Naga. And two years ago, I wrote a verse novel called The Mistress Washes Praise. It's about a young Muslim woman in Toronto who becomes romantically involved with a married man. When an excerpt of this won the Bronwyn Wallace Award, I read a couple poems at the ceremony. And unbeknownst to me, the reading was recorded. The recording was sent to my mother, who sent it to my father, who sent it to my grandmother in Egypt. And then the verse novel became a family affair. They'll think you're the mistress, my mother objected. My father waited until we were alone together to warn me that with writing comes a moral responsibility and that in a few years' time, my own ethics might evolve in contradiction to something I've already written, and at that point, it'll be too late to retract it. He was right, of course. This is, in fact, an aspiration of mine. I hope my ethics will be always evolving, always slipping out from under my feet to meet my level of experience. But my father's comment begged the question, was the verse novel I'd written somehow an articulation of my ethics? There is a belief in Islam that if you build a school or plant a tree or dig a well, if you discover a new cure for disease or produce a work of, u <coughs> sorry, of useful scholarship, then you've left behind a good that keeps on multiplying in the world long after you've left it. The Quran describes it as a grain of corn which grows seven ears, and each ear has a hundred grains. The flip side of this formula is also true a wrong committed or a misguidance transmitted can continue to injure both you and others ad infinitum. This is what my father is worried about. Islamically, even just airing out your own sins or shortcomings is considered injurious because of the possibility that it will inspire others. How then can illicit love serve as my plot? You begin to see my problem. To complicate things further, I didn't just write about a Muslim mistress. I wrote about her in English, in Canada. My grandmother and I are exactly 50 years apart. We were living together in Egypt when I came home one day to find her sitting on the leather couch with something to say in her mouth. She had just heard the recording. If your character is going to be a Muslim, why make her a mistress? I started to explain the whole, the whole verse novel is about an affair. Okay, she countered. If she must be a mistress, why make her a Muslim? Muslims can be mistresses too. Yes, okay, she conceded. That might be true, but they are already saying about us what you are now saying about us. That we're wicked and animal and dangerous. They already hate us, and they love to see you agree with them. My grandmother didn't say, you're hurting us. She didn't have to. It's impossible to be a Muslim exposed to Western literature, media, and pop culture without feeling that we're living in a time of representational warfare. From the young, submissive, sorry, from the young, unshaven suicide bombers to the obese, tyrannical oil sheikhs to the abused, submissive, hijab-wearing wives. The stereotypes come in many flavors, all of which are negative, and many of which are deadly to people in the Middle East. The invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, for example, which collectively resulted in over 200,000 civilian deaths, was predicated on years of pathologizing those same civilians as threatening and subhuman. This is not just an American problem. Since 2001, over 40,000 Canadian forces personnel have been deployed to Afghanistan. Canada is the second largest arms exporter to the Middle East, second only to the US. But foreign policy is always a story here before its boots on the ground over there. All mechanisms of violence depend on the dramatization of difference between self and other. Given the dominant narrative around Muslims right now and the bloodshed that it engenders, there's an understandable anxiety in my community about how to rescue our image on the international stage. There's been a movement of writers, poets in particular, scrabbling to produce positive representations of us that demonstrate 
our peacefulness, intelligence, modernity, our relatability, even our moral superiority. Horse sense dictates that in order to prove to someone who thinks you're an animal, that you're a human, you have to show them that you're a saint or a martyr. You have to overshoot the mark in order to land on it. Hence, the plethora of activist literature allegedly combating the demonization of Muslims by making an opera of our victimhood. If a book written by one of us is not loudly objecting or defending or educating in this way, it's often considered not just irrelevant, but actually incorrect, as though literature were a kind of political mathematics. This is most apparent in English. Among ourselves, in our own languages, we can afford to explore other questions, but as minorities and populations that have the power to hurt us, both here and overseas, there's an expectation that literary work will double as activism. My problem with this species of protest, however, is that it invalidates itself. When all the art a marginalized group produces is reactionary, defensive, didactic, outraged, it empowers the voice of the center by talking to it. I'm reminded of a tweet by the Muslim Australian poet Omar Sa'r, in which he says, if we stay stuck in a news cycle of Muslim monster versus Muslim human, we lose. To debate your humanity is to implicitly agree it's uncertain. When literature considers itself a corrective prescription for xenophobes, it privileges xenophobic readers. It respects their accusations enough to challenge them. And the more energy exhausted in communicating with an aggressor, the more their power and centrality is affirmed. Hence, to write in response to hatred is to fail before you've begun. My grandmother's objection turned out to be a composite of my parents. Like my mother, she's concerned that the verse novel will be read autobiographically as a collective confession on behalf of an entire religion. Like my father, her concern is ethical rather than aesthetic. She's less interested in what the work is than in what it will do in the world. She worries that a Canadian audience will read about a Muslim mistress and take Islam itself to be licentious. She thinks this co country isn't ready to allow a Muslim character that much individuality. After a year of ruminating on this question, I turn it to you. Are we ready? For Muslim writers in Canada, we can't escape the possibility that our work will be read in the service of bigotry. But we can, I think, choose to ignore the bigots. Let them talk to themselves. We elect the imaginary readers that we write for, and so we are responsible for the host of expectations and restrictions that they bring to our pages. Personally, I believe there is space in Canlit between the Muslim terrorist and the Muslim martyr for a Muslim mistress. In fact, I think she's necessary if we're gonna escape the defense position we've been occupying for years. I realize that writing such a character means I may be understood by my own community as having betrayed them, as having showed outsiders our lingerie, showed them our desire for touch, our disappointment in God sometimes, our difficulty praying sometimes. There is a pressure on Muslim writers in Canada to have all your characters on their best behavior, perfect table manners. But I want to write as though I have nothing to prove, as though I were writing to a country that loves me already, and my mother's hijab and my father's beard. Toronto, I want to be on my worst behavior. <laughs> and have you know what I mean?